our speaker is Adrian Budd, who is a lecturer in international relations at London South Bank University, who's going to be speaking on uh, is China a new global superpower? So please take it away. When this meeting was planned two or three months ago, is China the new global superpower? Had I written it two or three months ago, I'd have been a bit cheesed off because the last two weeks have seen enormous changes on the back of the war in Ukraine. There's clearly a drive now to put extra pressure on China from the West. And therefore, although I will address the question of whether China is the new superpower, I'll be bouncing back and forth between China and the West and looking at their mutual relationships and not just focusing on, on China. That might work for better. Okay? It's nice enough to this. <laughs> Sorry, comments. Should I do them both? Hold it. If you hold it like this. Thank you very much. Better. I watched the program about Nick Jagger last night. He never had any of this problem. Is it made in China? So, um, is China the new global superpower? The title of the talk. And it's quite clear that China has become a major power. I'll address the question of whether it's a superpower in the conclusion, and I'll build up towards that conclusion by looking at various aspects of China's power, notably economic power, although I think we're pretty, pretty much all clear on that now. Over the last 40 years, there's been a stupendous transformation in China's economic power. I'll also then look at the military side of things, not dwelling too much on it. It seems to me still that much of the, certainly military hardware and that sort of thing is sort of a bit toys for the boys, old security studies, but it's nevertheless important. And then I will say something about China's global reach and put that in context. It has a global reach, but it is far weaker, far smaller than America and the West global reach. And we have to get all this into perspective. But it's quite clear that economically, and to a lesser extent militarily, China is now the major challenger to the United States as the world's major imperial power, particularly at a regional level. And so great has been the growth of China, so rapid, uh, and so threatening from the Western ruling class point of view, that there is widespread talk of uh, a new Cold War. Uh, these are pictures are from pretty well-established, high-grade media firms like the Financial Times and so on. And they're all saying the same sort of thing. Over the last few years, they've run series on whether there is a new Cold War between the United States and uh, China. Obviously, today, they would add uh, Russia in there. And it was never meant to be like this. When China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, from pushed by Clinton, who relaxed the rules on China's human rights record and all that sort of stuff, it was, there was talk about regime change, that bringing China into the so-called rules-based world order uh, led by the United States and the West more generally, it would force China to play by Western rules. It would, if you like, tame China from a Western point of view and even lead to re regime change as a new middle class would grow and demand transformation and so on. But it didn't work out like that. China's played a very cagey hand. It's done very well in that 20 years, 21 years. And in the last half a decade or more, perhaps a decade or so, it's quite clear that the West has moved to a much more careful position in relation to China, a much more worried position, as this sort of thing indicates, and particularly since about 2018, for every Chinese action, there has been a Western reaction, and these have come thicker and faster in the last even two weeks. Uh, it's moved extremely rapidly in the last two weeks. So that's really the introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk, therefore, about this question of whether China is re replacing America or challenging America as a superpower on the, on the back of some economic analysis, some military analysis, and looking at uh, China's global role in Africa and Latin America and elsewhere. Let's look at the economic rise. And here, I mean, I, I did this meeting 
when we were last here in this room, actually three years ago, physically, and probably waxed lyrical a little bit about China's rise, because it is completely stupendous. There's no doubt about it. Now, there's the data for what it's worth. Mainstream data doesn't always tell us the full, uh, the full picture. But in 1980, just at the, when the process of post-Mao reform began, 1978 actually, speeded up in 1992, but you could say 1980 more or less is when the post-Mao reforms began. China accounted for 1% of global output. The latest figures I've seen on a slightly different measure, which we needn't go into, it's now bigger than America. The, the real, the, the part of the world that should most worry about this is actually the European Union. The decline of America has been quite slow. The decline of Europe has been much more precipitate in this period. That's the data on the top uh, chart. The second one shows China's manufacturing output. And you can see it's way ahead of any other competitor in terms of manufacturing. So from 1% of world output, we're, not, we're talking now about 20% of world output in little over a generation. That is pretty astronomical stuff. We can add other things. This was in the Financial Times two weeks ago. The world, who's come across these things? What are they called? Exaflops. There you go. <laughs> a billion, billion operations per second is what the supercomputers can now do. The first one to achieve a billion, billion, it's in America. But the graph shows, if anybody can see it, in 2010, half the world's supercomputers were in America. The red ones, China's um, contribution, there was about 2 or 3%. Today, it's about 38% of the world's supercomputers in, America, in uh, China and less than a quarter in America. You can go on. I will go on. <laughs> Just one more piece of information to show how China's been transformed. That is, sorry, but the light's a bit um, bright, but you might just be able to see that in 2008, the tiny little light blue lines between Shanghai Airport and Shanghai Downtown, and the same for Beijing, was the extent of China's high-speed train network, the TGVs from France, that sort of equivalent. A decade later, that's the high-speed train network at the bottom, which is more train lines built in a decade than the entire rest of the world has as high-speed trains ever. So this is the extent of the transformation. I'm not sure I need to say any more because it's not the crucial part of the lecture. We know China's a major economic power and we know also that Xi Jinping, the president, has promoted an idea, a, a vast industrial policy called Made in China 2025, which is design, designed to perpetuate that and to lead China into new technology areas with a vision of the future leading in these new, the quantum internet, somebody might say what that is, uh, robotics, uh, space technologies of various sorts, many of them with a military dimension, but certainly up there, cutting edge technologies. The idea is to keep up the pace of change. Now, this all comes at enormous cost, by the way, and if we had another meeting on China's economic, pending economic crisis, I do think such a thing is happening. And I tell you what, just as an aside, Tony Cliff's book on state capitalism in Russia when he looked at the form of the crisis in Russia, waste, stagnation, I think the state sector has already got that in China. And the next time there's a more classical crisis of profitability, the, the, the private sector in China will be afflicted by that. And there could be a sort of double dose of crisis in China in the coming period. But we're, the talk's not about that. Uh, the crisis will have many dimensions. Here's one. The enormous cost to the environment of this ra ra rapid growth. The uncontrolled growth, this again reflects a bit the Soviet Union. It's not a planned economy, there's target setting, but the, the local authorities compete with each other to produce, to produce, to produce, to attract foreign direct investment from uh, global multinationals. They out-compete each other to produce motorways that nobody uses, high-speed train networks where the trains are less than half full, and so on. Terrible waste. It's captured in this rather excellent but slightly balmy book, uh, 
China's engine of environmental collapse. Superb book in terms of this analysis and data. Doesn't believe China's socialist, for instance, talks about Stalin's capitalism or something along those lines, although it's slightly ranty and talks about Xi Jinping's demonic stare and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> but the data in it is really quite something. And the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and the wider devastation of China's ecology is, a, is a, a looming problem. Another looming problem, so if you can't see that, China's emissions are about twice that of America's now, by the way. It's not very clear. Another problem is inequality, uh, what Trotsky called uneven development. Combined and uneven development, me, thinking about that on an international scale, but also it applies at a local level within China. Gleaming skyscrapers, of course this happens all over the world, but it's extremely sharp when you've had this massive increase in wealth unevenly shared. Uh, I've just seen Simon... There's other problems. The Xinjiang problem, the national question in China is a looming, uh, a looming problem. The, so you have the longest bridges in the world, the fastest trains, the tallest this, the widest that. Thank you. And people living in corrugated iron and cardboard and so on and so forth. Uh, Thomas Piketty recently did a blog to emphasize this question of inequality. The darkest line, the one in the middle, that's the top 10% of wealth owners. And at the time of the start of the reform process, they held about 25% of the world, of the uh, Chinese assets. It's now 40. Meanwhile, the bottom 50% have gone from 25 down to whatever that is, about 15. So there's widening inequality. This is for a different meeting, but it is an indication that China's going to be facing some problems. And it's a backdrop to our discussion about uh, China as a superpower. So let's move on to the military question. China's economy is, has grown rapidly. It, its economic might underpins its growing military power. And that's what we're going to move on to. OK, so what has ha been happening at the military level? China's halved its military forces in the last 20 years, from about 4 million in the People's Liberation Army to about 2 million. At the same time, it's gone from three quarters of them, if you like, locally focused, the army, defending the motherland and all this sort of stuff, not engaging terribly much in adventurous wars. Uh, three quarters of them were in the army. Now it's less than half of them in the army, and the other half are in more what you might say, the power-projecting parts of the military, the Navy and the Air Force. These have been extremely rapidly modernised. Uh, one illustration of that is aircraft carriers. This is where it gets a bit toys for the boys. It won't take long. Aircraft carriers are the naval form for power projection because you can live off the coast of, I don't know where, let's say Iran, if you're in the American... Medi uh, fleet for six months lobbing things at Iran or Iraq or wherever. So aircraft carriers are important for global power projection and there are authors in China who talk about adapting uh, um, de developing a, a blue seas capability get out of the South China Sea into the oceans and further afield so you can influence political and military outcomes all over the world. Um, now, aircraft carriers, so what have we got? We've got one aircraft carrier. The first Chinese aircraft carrier was a second-hand Soviet one bought from Ukraine about a decade ago, refurbished. It's now working. The second one, they copied it a few years ago. The third one has just come in, into commission. The fourth one is undergoing tests. There's a suggestion that five and six, I don't know why I put two fingers up there, five and six, uh, the next two, uh, nuclear powered, are being shelved. But that sort of growth in aircraft carrier capability is what fuels this argument that there is a new Cold War, that the China is at the doors of the West and, uh, and so on. And it's certainly true that its growing power has emboldened the uh, Chinese Navy 
in the South China Sea. Again, it's not very clear. Um, China's at the top in a sort of pale orange. The big sort of epiglottis shape, U shape thing, is its territorial claim. The socialist revolution took over the nationalists' territorial claims, lock, stock, and barrel, did not question them. And that's a claim that means that it claims the territorial waters as its own right down to the coast of Malaysia. But what it means also is it's constantly coming up against in rivalry, uh, naval rivalry, with all the literal powers of the South China Sea. And as it's grown economically, it's been able to militarise the area. So these little yellow and orange dots in the middle here, the Spratly Islands, Paracel Islands, and various shoals and reefs and so on, have been militarised in the last decade. Building uh, aircraft runways, port facilities, military uh, facilities. The crucial thing about this area is 50% of the world's trade goes through the South China Sea and something like 80% of Asia's oil imports go through it. So from, from the point of view of China, it is of extreme strategic uh, importance. Now, when we look at the South China Sea more generally, and there are other illustrations that show, show the United States has moved very, very heavily into that area. It conducts hundreds of annual military exercises with its allies in the region. So from Beijing's point of view, it is America's the problem in our backyard. OK, now, the next slide reinforces that. Because from Beijing's point of view, if you're looking out at the strategic landscape around you, what you see, underlined in blue, is a set of allies of the United States, all pretty wealthy, all well-armed, I'll come back to the arms spending in a minute, facing you and trying to hold you into what um, the Americans call the first island chain, the chain of islands down from Japan right down to Indonesia, trying to hem China in which is why Chinese strategists talk about um, deep blue sea capability, pushing out beyond that in the way that America patrols the world's oceans. The blue ones then are some of the world's richest countries. What you can't see is New Zealand and Australia. Okay, India's hedging it bet, its bets and is working with both the United States and China in various ways. The white ones to the west of China underlined in white, Russia, Kazakhstan, the Stans and Pakistan, and India is because it's hedging its bets. Some have said this is a new Chinese-based NATO in Asia, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's mistaken. It's a much looser arrangement. There's no mutual defense agreement, Article 5. What it is, is a group of countries with a loose interest, common interest amongst their rulers of crushing Islamic dissent. They're, the overwhelming majority of their joint operations are against internal terrorists um, in the stands and so on and so forth. In the event of a war, China would, does not really have an alliance structure to speak of. It's much more isolated and therefore weaker than the, um, the West. Now, that was before two weeks ago. It was isolated and weaker. But in the last two weeks, the transformation in the global situation, or the beginnings of a transformation, have been quite astronomical. The NATO meeting, did it end on Thursday? Or have I got them week, weeks mixed up? Thursday, was it? Well, no, Thursday, let's say it was Thursday. One week or other, it was on Thursday. The National Security Advisor of the United States, Jake Sullivan, said at the beginning of the meeting that the last NATO strategic revision, uh, strategic doctrine revision, referred to Russia as a strategic partner and didn't mention China at all. This meeting, he said, will speak very directly and in a clear-eyed way to the multifaceted challenge posed by the People's Republic of China. So NATO is thinking very much about 
the Far East. For the first time, the West's major allies in the Far East were inv invited to a NATO summit. That's uh, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea. This is the real extension of NATO in Asia, not the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's a Western power push. And it's therefore not surprising in, in that context. I mean, there's political and moral and all sorts of other questions. But it's not surprising that Beijing, along with much of the global south, actually, has been relatively quiet, if not almost silent, about you, Russia and Ukraine. Because they're the ones who feel the pressure of the United States. They saw the expansion of uh, NATO up to um, Russian borders. And there's now talk, albeit at the very beginnings of the talk, about something called Ruknank. There you go. Russia, China, and North Korea forming a deeper alliance because of the threat of NATO. So we don't know if that's true. But it is suggestive of a deepening of tensions in Asia in relation to China and the West moving rapidly. And if they're going to do that, they're going to do what George Orwell talked about all states doing, creating an external enemy, ramping up the external enemy in the same way that, you know, the recreation of the Soviet threat under Reagan to justify nuclear missiles in Europe and so on. So let's get a picture of what's actually happening. I mentioned aircraft carriers. China's got more. Wow. Is it threatening? Well, let's look at the figures. There's the figures. Uh, it's in alphabetical order on the left. I should have taken China out and put it separately. But there's the number of commissioned aircraft carriers, those on trial, it, undergoing trials, uh, those under construction, and the planned ones. If you add it all together, China and its allies, in this case I'm saying Russia's an ally. It's not absolutely clear, but it probably isn't. More an ally. Thank you. Um, has got, what's, what's the number? Four or five. The America and its allies have got 37. America alone has got 20 and is planning 13 more. So the real power of power projection via aircraft carriers comes from the West, not from China. And this is indicative of a wider trend. For all the fear of China in the West, the actual data show, so you can't see that, it's um, CIPRI, the Stockholm International Research Institute on Arms Spending. So it's pretty high quality data. Uh, last year's spending, 2020, last year's data for 2020, total arms spending, I rounded it. And what have we got? We've got China spending 270 billion on arms last year, and the West in total at 1.173 trillion, of which the United States spends 768 <coughs> billion. So America's spending is what? Three and a bit times that of China. So this conditions our understanding of whether is China is the next superpower. A major power, yes, but not anywhere near the power of the United States. Let's end that on the military then. China's global reach. The article I wrote in International Socialism does quite a bit of this in Africa. It talks about the... Uh, Chinese investment in Latin America as well. So I'll just cover a little bit. Much is made of China's global reach, and in particular, the new <coughs> Belt and Road Initiative, announced by Xi Jinping in 2013. A vast network of infrastructural spending to connect China's markets and suppliers to the Chinese economy. It's reputed to... The plan is to spend about a hundred, hang on a minute, let's get me trillions and the billions right, a uh, trillion dollars by about 2030. One to four trillion. One to four trillion, thank you, by 2025, 2030. Uh, something like the figures vary where whenever you look, 69 countries and 23 international bodies have signed up, or 100 countries, but a lot of countries are signed up, as you can see by the, the, the maritime connection through the Red Sea and uh, Piraeus and so on, or the overland rail connection, which will end up in Barking. 
which from a Marxist point of view, that wasn't supposed to be a joke, I'll just, because we're in East London, that's it. Um, um, from a Marxist economic point of view, it will increase or shorten turnover time. So goods going to market over sea take five weeks to come from China, but by train there'll be five days. Therefore, the realisation of the value in, involved will get back to China much faster and then you can start a new round of production and so on. So this is partly it's an economic question. Partly it's about security of supplies. Partly, though, as the um, South China Morning Post put it recently, it makes sense not only geostrategically for China, but economically as a way to challenge, uh, to, to channel excess domestic capacity whether savings or industrial. In other words, a classic Marxist analysis of imperialism, surplus capital at home, the export of capital, this fits this beautifully. Unproductive state-owned enterprises who are turning a profit of 1% to 2% in China can make more if they could invest in ports and other facilities in other parts of the world. So there is a geostrategic component to this. Is that going to then turn the rest of the world closer politically towards China? And as some have written uh, about the idea of a new Beijing consensus to replace the Washington consensus. Well, no. Beijing plays by the Washington consensus rules. When it enters Africa, we'll look at Africa in a minute, it, uh, it famously it doesn't um, apply the conditionality. It doesn't say you've got to have regime change, you've got to become more liberal democratic or more economically liberal, more likely. It accepts the prevailing powers. Nigel Harris wrote about this 40 years ago in an SWP book about Mao's China. When Mao, Maoism claimed to be revolutionary, he pointed out this idea of non-intervention, a non-challenge of the sovereignty, meant not supporting the protest movements and workers' movements against rotten regimes. This persists. So sovereignty is an extremely important part of Chinese uh, foreign, foreign uh, policy. And it seems to me that there is very little evidence that China is challenging the Washington consensus. And indeed, where's slide? What slide are we on? Let's look at Africa. What's happening in Africa? China is investing more in Africa. It's building uh, rail connections and so on and so forth. But its pattern in regard to Africa is very traditional northern pattern of extracting um, raw materials and agricultural products and so on, shipping them to China. China manufactures things and then ships them back to Africa. Similarly, on a bit of bigger scale, actually, in Latin America, it's very similar in Latin America, and a new extractivism, as uh, we had an article about it not very long ago by Martin Upchurch, the new extractivism, the rich countries extracting raw materials and so on from the poorer parts of the world. And this is provoking global, uh, civil society in Africa. Patrick Bond, who's spoken at Marxism a time or two recently, has edited a book from African trade unionists and African civil society activists beginning to criticise China's role in Africa because, for instance, they will do a deal with Mugabe's Zimbabwe government with no reference to what the Zimbabwean people want, which shored the, shored the army up and, and, so on, and, so, and so on and so forth. So how that Belt and Road Initiative works is state-owned banks in China mop up Chinese savings lend them to poorer countries on the condition that they use Chinese construction firms who are finding it hard to make a profit in China. They build railways, which is fine. The railways are fine, but I haven't seen the map. But my, I've seen a map which was then criticised by a state official of some sort in China saying it's not accurate. So all these activists on, on Twitter said, well, send us the accurate one then, and it went silent. So what the map showed was uh, railway lines coming in from ports, going into the middle of somewhere, mm. Congo, and then then going back again and extract, extracting value. Uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein wrote 
uh, the development uh, economist and world systems thinker a long time ago, that imperialism constructed what he called a mad pattern of railways in Africa, in and out. No connections between African countries. No autonomous development enabled. Just get the stuff out that we want, diamonds and such like. I think when we do get an accurate map of China, we'll get something very similar to that. Uh, I can't prove it yet. So there's a collaboration between Chinese ruling class and the African ruling class in, in this extractive relationship. So the idea of... China as an alternative to the Washington system is far-fetched. I'll sum up with just what's happened in the last two weeks. The NATO me meeting I've mentioned. South China Morning Post um, reported on the 16th of, uh, 18th of June that China's foreign direct investment in Latin America and the Caribbean represented 6.5% of the total. In other words, it's a drop in the ocean. It's not the major player that the West is pre presenting it as. The figures vary year on year. Uh, six years ago, Ernst & Young produced data for Africa that showed that China's investment in 2016 was 36 billion. America was only 6 billion in Africa. And everybody said, bloody hell, it's six times as big. The next year, the Netherlands was the largest investor in Africa and China was second. In other words, different projects come on at different times and we need a longer time span. So we need to be careful with the data. But what is clear is that at the Summit for the Americas, what's it called? The Latin American... Somebody will know it. I've got it written down somewhere, but I've got to shut up. The Latin American something. Uh, yeah. Um, two or three weeks ago, they had their annual summit. The focus was on combating China in Latin America, driven by Biden. The last couple of weeks, we've had the announcement at the G7. This was the 27th of June. The Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, a direct challenge to the Belt and Road Initiative, where the West pledges, well, we know how good they are on pledges, the carbon payments to the poorer South, Glen Eagles on so, um, the sustainable development goals and all that. All the pledges, in a way, amount to nothing. But they have pledged 600 billion by 2027, 20, a lot short of the one to four trillion, but a recognition that um, the West needs to challenge, from their point of view, the. Um, the Chinese involvement in the global south. The arrogance with which this sort of stuff is presented is captured by a senior American official said that this initiative of infrastructure building would be an alternative to the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative's debt traps. We all know the West hate debt traps. They've never indebted anybody and there's never been a debt crisis. But there is some truth in this, and this just goes back to the argument that China's not much different. It has indebted. Sri Lanka's the most obvious one. Uh, look, Sri Lanka was indebted. China then built the port. Sri Lanka, for reasons of a more general debt to the West and, and, to the West and China, couldn't afford to repay. Therefore, China nabbed a 99-year lease on the port. This is extremely reminiscent mm -hmm. of Hong, Hong Kong, Kong and all those other uh, concessions that China was forced to make. Um, final thing, conclusion then. Sorry, I've, my timing is a bit out. I've gone on too long, Chair. I beg yeah, your pardon. Really, You've I, been I tough as... To tough as it's, I blame the technology. <laughs> uh, I already gave you two minutes extra for that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> Superpowers are characterised by a variety of things. A combination in shifting balances between economic power, ideological appeal, military power, uh, and so on. The alliance structures. China hasn't got much of that. It's got the economic power, although there's some fragility. It's got a growing military power, albeit that it's in a regional location primarily. It doesn't have the appeal for what it was worth, what we called state capitalist Soviet Union. Stalinism did have a mass appeal, had big communist parties around the world for a while supporting it. China doesn't have any of that, and its alliance structure, as we've seen, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it amounts to very little. In that sense, 
In a linear way, yes, it's the most likely candidate to be the next superpower. But if you're looking at it in a Marxist way, between now and then, I think there's an awful lot that can go wrong with China. And also, the West is fighting back. And from the, the main enemy, in terms of holding a reactionary world together, remains the United States. It does not mean that we always side with China, or we ever side with China's ruling class against the United States. It's a bit like neither Beijing nor Washington, a bit like neither Washington nor Moscow, uh, because, and again, I'm not doing what's going on internally in, the United, in, the, in China, but it is a rotten and reactionary ruling class. Um, Rob may speak about that to some extent this afternoon. So I'll leave it that. The, the final conclusion then, it's, it is, it's not yet a superpower, and it's got, it, but it is provoking the West to reveal just how violent capitalism in its Western liberal variant and any other variant can be. And our task is to build a movement that challenges both forms of capitalism. Hi, Hans Peter from the Bolshevik Tendency. I think there are actually academic, there is academic research on China and Africa. Um, by the China Africa Research Institute. Um, I can't remember which US university it is, but if you Google it, you'll find it. Um, they're disputing um, actually the, the claim of debt trap diplomacy and even the, have questions about that Sri Lankan investment um, and say <laughs> it certainly doesn't, uh, doesn't match the, the classic IMF's uh, way of, of doing business. Uh, as the speakers also mentioned, they don't come in and, and tell governments, what they can and can't do, and so on. <clears throat> um, but the other point I wanted to make is uh, with regards to, it, to its regime internally. I think it, uh, it um, matches much more the, the Soviet Union during the new economic period of the new economic policy. So the, uh, the Dang, Dang, Dang's reforms aimed at getting Western technology into the country and then letting, the, uh, letting elements of the Chinese working class be super exploited by imperialist companies. Um, so, um, but the, the core is still um, a collectivized economy. Uh, it's not planned in the, in the good old, like in the good old Mao days, but the, China, the CCP, um, <laughs> well, good old in quotation marks, uh, the, 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 the CCP still uh, retains a lot of control over the economy um, via, particularly via the financial system, which is mostly state-controlled. Mm -hmm. um, but also to the, to the benefit of the working, working class to an extent. Um, for example, uh, the, the, the decreasing level of absolute poverty in China um, is something that even the United Nations had to admit um, was a success. Um, the Chinese economy, for example, wasn't harmed in the same way by the capitalist global economic crisis in, in the same way that um, uh, the capitalist world was. Um, those sectors of the economy that were uh, capitalist, uh, that contribute to the capitalist export uh, economy um, were, but the, the state-owned sectors went, were relatively unharmed. And so um, I think, but obviously, um, the CCP isn't, isn't in favor of strikes. Um, it's, it's kind of um, it's playing working class pressure against imperialist pressure in a way, whereby occasionally they support strikes. They've, they've, uh, they've presided over wage rises in Guangdong province um, uh, for a while now, uh, which meant that many of the, the, the multi uh, multinationals have uh, migrated to, to where they can produce cheaper, uh, like Bangladesh and Malaysia and so on. Um, but fundamentally, um, my view is that, that Marxists have to support China in a conflict with the West because the West um, aims to, to bring about regime change to, to, to reduce the, the, and destroy the, the collectivized, uh, the remains of the collectivized economy and to bring, to turn China into a, a global sweatshop again and, and broaden that model to the, to, to the entirety of the Chinese economy. Um, but that doesn't mean um, that we are uncritical uh, of, of the uh, CCP, but instead we um, so call for, minutes, so call call for um, political revolution to overthrow the CCP and mm -hmm. to, to bring 
the economy into democratic workers' control. Thank you. If you could pass it to the comrade behind you in the black t-shirt, and then and then uh, the comrade behind in red, in, in orange, then we'll get somewhere else in the ring. So thank you very much. I'm an uh, honored judge. I'm a postdoctoral fellow of Chinese studies at a university in India, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. China is not a superpower yet, but I think the criteria for what a superpower is need to be more clearly defined. You were talking about toys for the boys and completely missed hypersonic missiles, right? This, this, is, this, is, the, this is the next arms race of the future, is hyper, tactical hypersonic missiles that can evade in all interception systems. And um, China is closer than the United States to having operational ones. So in terms of power projection, that is missing. Anti-satellite weapons also, China and, uh, and Russia have um, collaborated on using each other's grounding stations for their satellite network, meaning that their satellite network can cover the whole world. And if they have anti-satellite weapons, they can cripple the US um, uh, infrastructure. Oh, slight correction, heading, hedging bets um, with um, China. India hedging bets with China. It's, it's actually hedging its bets with Russia. So India is reliant on Russian energy for its purposes and is in direct confrontation with China because of the Pakistan issue. Um, Europe was initially hedging its bets um, with China, being on the fence about China and saying China could be a force for you know our, our own economic development if we cooperate with them. And the US was very much against it. You had European countries, including the UK, that joined the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And uh, the US and Japan were totally opposed to it. Uh, but now the US is using the Ukraine crisis to hijack the issue and force NATO into its corner and its stance vis a vis China. So I think that this is important. You've already touched on um, imperialism and neoliberal conditions, structural adjustment programs that China is not imposing on um, African investment recipient countries. Um, but I think maybe a clearer definition that imperialism is would also be important. And thank you very much for your uh, insights and contribution. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question as a non-expert. Um, the, 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 close, the closure of Shanghai for two months, mm. yeah? I mean, it's just a hunch. I have a question mark in my head. Is it partly due to overproduction? Because you mentioned the word overproduction. I mean, can they actually afford to send a whole workforce home? Did they get, did they get their salaries in, during these two months? Uh, I mean, can, can you say something about, in fact, somebody in the public can say something about that. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have overproduction, then you can actually afford to close factories down, and it doesn't affect you so much. So that's, that's just a question. So after, the comrade in the, the Teflon's t-shirt at the back, um, and after them will be you right here. Yes, yes, right at the back. Yeah. So thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm Sarah Lawson, I'm from the Philippines. Thank you very much. The comrade here will be followed by the person next to them. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask about the idea of like what we mean by a superpower and what metrics in particular we judge it by. So for instance, a lot of the talk so far has been about sort of the idea of a superpower in the hegemonic like capitalist and so we talked about the idea of like GDP, economic dominance, military dominance, that sort of stuff. I guess my first question is to what extent should we consider China is trying to dominate by these metrics? And if so, should they be the metrics we're using? Because I guess, for instance, within China, the official like, party line is that the country is pursuing socialism with Chinese characteristics. I guess that's not really a fixed mindset about the way they want to like, develop politically. And for instance, the line of like the Chinese government things like common prosperity and the idea of how to like, involve the market in achieving wider social goals is something that's developed a lot in recent years, especially as the governments intervene in certain sectors of the economy, like private education, for instance. So I think we've spoken a lot about the idea 
third way, you know, like neither Washington or Beijing, but like to what extent does China also show potential to help achieve this third way in itself? And to what extent should we see that as like an evolving mechanism by which we can say China is wanting to become a global superpower? Mm. The comment here will be followed by the comment at the back on the chair. Thank you for your interesting talk. I just think it's important to acknowledge that foreign direct investment has been proven by many economists to be the better option rather than aid dependency, which proliferated by the West. It just creates further corruption and just finances, um, money laundering, and corrupt governance. And also, I think we should also acknowledge the West's role in disrupting China. Historically, we see that in the European wars. We also see that solution, which is often, as Britain and USA have switched to more service-based economies, we have exported our pollution and manufacturing industries into China. So we should acknowledge that pollution, which we've seen in the data. Thank you. After which comrade will be the comrade at the front here. Thank you. Thank you. We are really at the crossroad. Uh, we went into the pandemic uh, with the, the largest uh, climate strike we have seen ever among you, and we are going out of the uh, pandemic with a total polarized world, uh, uh, where we have the war, war in Ukraine, and then we have now with the NATO summit spelled out very clearly that we are going for a period with massive uh, rearmament. Uh, and we really have to see what that means. One thing of course, it's uh, the fact that we can say that China is not as big as they say, but they are a really contender uh, to the Western imperial world, and, and that's what they think, and that's what they're going to do. So we are going to a much more polarized world, and we have to have to be clear uh, to mobilize uh, against that. And, and I think the, the, the answer is actually to do the same thing as we did before the Iraq war, because why did uh, the mobilization against the Iraq uh, war become so big? Actually, it was a long, long struggle before the war to say that it's going to be a war. And it was also a struggle to get the anti-globalization movement to take on the, the war uh, issue. And that was a hard struggle. And it wouldn't have been so big if, if we managed, uh, did manage to fuse those uh, two things. And we have to do the same. Uh, we have learned in Norway that we actually, that's uh, easier to mobilize the youth uh, from the uh, environment movement than uh, uh, in anti-war position, because they see this as a, uh, you know, a, a, t a total uh, question about where is the world going. Are we going uh, to a period where we have a poor world that all the re resources is going to make war, or are we going to a, a period with neutral countries uh, uh, fighting together to solve the climate issue? So by, by putting forward the, uh, the slogan of, uh, against all kind of uh, rearmament, that's really the thing that can unite those two, two movements uh, against war and against uh, the tendency uh, we see now with the NATO summit. I, I think we are really at, at the crossroad, and we have to see that, and we have to start to build from that. Uh, from now. This is a really historic turning uh, uh, point, I think. Thank you very much. The comment at the front here will be followed by the comment at the end of the second row over here. Thanks, Colin, and thanks, Adrian, for an excellent uh, talk. Uh, just to come back on the first contribution, um, I've got two words for you. Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Look at how the Chinese state has, has repressed the people of Hong Kong. Look at what happened to Chairman Square. We have to take a side in that situation, and our side is the side of the working class and the people and, and, and resisting in Hong Kong and across China. That's the, that, that's, the, that's the side we take. And I think when you talk about, you know, the, 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 the Chinese still goes away. It's staggering, you know, 20, 20, 15, 20 percent, 10 percent. It means it's, the buildings are being built every 10 years. You go to cities like you know, Shenzhen, which was a fish, fishing village, a sign of Arigat or whatever, in, in 1984, and is now you know, 19 million, 20 million. And, and, the, and the way that, you know, this, this huge growth has been based on the backs of the migrant workers coming in from the ship towers, which I shouldn't swear to them, whatever, the crappy conditions that are living in the shelters Adrian had on, on, the, on, the, on the screen, with no rights within the cities. And that's what, that, that's what this growth has been based on. But then you look at 2008, when the world was crashing around, how did China get, 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 well, say, get out of it? It went on a massive spending balloon. All those, you know, those, 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 uh, the railways and the roads and the, and the ghost cities and the, you know, the number of subways and the, the cities are it's staggering. But that's also based on debt. Now I'm going to ask Adrian, Adrian a question. What is going to happen to this debt? Because at some point it's going to surface. And the final thing, 
up until a few months ago, whenever I got depressed, which happened regularly, about the, the British working class and the lack of struggle, I would go to, I think it's called the Chinese Bureau Map, and I'd look at the number of strikes going on in China. And it's not, it's not legal to strike in China, but I'd start doing research about why people were going on strike, and it always made me happy. It made me smile, because despite the, re the repression, and by God, there is repression in China, which again, go back to the comment, there's massive repression, but they, they jump, jump on anything they can. Actually, people continue to fight back, whether it's against polluting factories, whether it's against uh, you know, not being paid, etc., whether it's against land grant, they continue to fight. Now, the other question how has COVID stopped that fight or delayed that fight? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. we'll I, I, I want to say I, that we have loads of uh, loads of hands at the corner. Please do keep your contributions as quick as possible. I'm trying to fit as many people in as possible. After the comment here, will be the uh, comment as, in the black I'll be as quick as I can, uh, and I don't, I don't speak Chinese really fast, I swear, but the first minute may sound like they do. Firstly, China is a superpower, okay? It is a superpower. The world economy defaults to China being the richest nation. It was the richest nation until 1850, around about then. It is going to be the richest nation again around about 2050. It is not a nation, it is an empire. It is a multi-ethnic empire with all the problems and all the benefits that that brings to any nation. It does do the work it differently around the world. To, to use an anecdote, one uh, mayor of an African city said, the, the British visit, they bring us a lecture. The Chinese visit, they bring us a, uh, a hospital. Because they build something to a so that their new visitor, their, their prime minister, or their thing, go there. And this makes a difference. But it does come with problems, okay? They, the debt thing is okay, that, that is a myth. It's a myth in which the way people are putting this in there. China does things differently. What is the most dangerous job in the world, by the way? Do you know? Mining. Chinese billionaire. More Chinese billionaires die than any other career in the world at an early age. It is a very dangerous position to be in. So there is, and that is a reflection of, of, a, of a band of warring brothers in the Chinese ruling class. They're a capitalist class. They take more control. If you think there's too many chains in China, you've not tried to catch one on, na on a national holiday weekend. Absolutely pass, as, and almost impossible to get one. All these investors, they're empty cities, they build them in advance, it's known as planning, then they move in. Some idiot from the West takes a photograph before people have moved in and they declare an abandoned empty city. You know, learn the way their economy works. But I'll tell you something, they are the world's manufacturing bases. What comes from being the biggest manufacturer in the world? The biggest working class in the world. And if we're communists, that's the solution to the problem. China is a superpower and it's building a massive working class, it's building its own grave digger. It is a Chinese working class that will bury capitalism around the world. It is not 20,000 strikes a month, according to these records. If you look them up, they have different names, labor disputes, national problems. But if you, if you record, you'll see that the Chinese working class will bury capitalism more before, long before the Western working class does. I, I have tried to get as many people in as possible. After the comrade here will be the comrade at the end of the front row who will be the final speaker. Hi, yeah. um, I've just got a kind of question which feeds maybe into the uh, cultural hegemony issue which was raised a little while ago. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I've, I, I'm an English language teacher. I've, I've taught, I taught in Vietnam for a couple of years in China for six months. Um, and uh, the, the Chinese have a, a, a really different way of uh, thinking about their, 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 like the relationship, I suppose, in the main part between uh, civil society and government. I know the Chinese Communist Party claims that uh, civil society is a bourgeois invention, but um, uh, the, the Chinese, um, they, in general, they don't seem to have an issue um, with like uh, this, this idea that came up recently that uh, there was going to be a policy whereby um, the economic output of each indi individual in China would be would, would be measured according to like a you know a centralized system. Um, I met a Chinese girl the the Tate Modern a, a little while ago and had a conversation with her about this. She asked me if such a system would ever be approved in the West, um, and I, I I said in my view almost certainly it wouldn't be because of our, our notion of individualism is far stronger. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, uh, if if there is this sense in in China that they have the, again this sense of civic responsibility, which is is quite alien to our, our sense, like our probably too developed sense of individualism. Um, uh, does uh, like doesn't that enable China to to increase its growth to to have the the majority of the population on site for whatever direction they decide to to pursue? Thank you. 
Thank you. The comrade at the end will be the final speech act. Yeah, thanks. I think you can get into an almost theological debate about what is a superpower. I think the way Adrian characterizes it is right, though. China is a major imperialist power, um, quite, uh, uh, and has a very brutal ruling class, and, and all the rest of it that pe people have said. But it doesn't match the capacity of the US at present. And we have to understand that because um, this is emerging as a major fault line in global politics. We have to be clear that the major threat to world peace at the moment is the US. You know, if you look at the AUKUS deal between the US, Australia and Britain, it, it's the US that's driving this process of sending nuclear submarines to patrol off the coast of China. There's not the inverse of that happening off the coast of America. So there's an imbalance in this competition. Nonetheless, China is emerging as a major, as I say, imperialist and capitalist power that's trying to do what all imperialist capitalist powers do, which is establish their own hegemony regionally and try to expand uh, their powers. I think it's important to say, though, and maybe Adrian can say a bit more about this, it's not simply the recapitulation of the old Cold War. China plays a very different role in the world economy through the sheer level of integration of China with circuits of global capitalism. That has very important implications. If I can just briefly spell out a couple of them. Um, what, one is that there's a the South Korean socialist said that there was an old slogan, US for security, China for, for economics. Now there's enormous pressure on the South Korean mm. ruling class to break with uh, China economically and integrate more with the US, but it's a very, very difficult, um, a difficult thing to achieve because of the sheer weight of China uh, now with the global economy. Even the US and China there are trade tariffs and so on, but there's enormous interdependence as well. I think we have to understand the complexities and contradictions as imposes. Can you sell that now, um, Yeah, just to end on this point then, uh, that shouldn't blind us to the possibility of inter-imperialist conflict. Germany and Britain were intensely integrated in the run of the First World War. It can still spill over into military, military conflicts. This fault line in world, world politics remains incredibly important for us. Now to sum up. Thank, Thank you. you. Gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, um, Go to Rob Oberman's meeting this afternoon for all the inter internals. No, I, I, look, that's a very wide ranging set of questions. So, what I'm going to do is talk about systems. We have to think of the world as a systemic whole, and we have to think of state capitalism as a, as a systemic whole. And that means that there are, of course, there are molecular changes over time. State capitalism today is not the same as state capitalism under Stalin or indeed Mao. And then the precise nature of inter-imperialist rivalry, the details, are not equivalent over decades. But nevertheless, those systems impart a logic that for all the will in the world, and I don't think he's actually got all the will in the world, uh, Xi Jinping, he has to act in a particular way. I'm not convinced that the Chinese ruling class thinks itself as a superpower. I think it is still got a sense of the humiliation, century of humiliation, that it's being, being bullied, mm -hmm. and it does what people do in this system. They fight back. It, the system is the problem, and that's why we've got to not change the government or put pressure to bear on Xi Jinping to see the error of his ways, but to overthrow the system. Now, uh, one or two speakers spoke about strikes and protests and so on, and it's very well worth looking at that. Just like other working classes, the Chinese working class, of course, it is the grave digger of the system. But it goes through phases. It, uh, and Cliff, again, I've referred to Cliff two or three times, Cliff talked not just about having class consciousness, but having, having cla class confidence. And confidence ebbs and flows. Between 2007 and 2015, there was a strike wave. We don't yet really have an integrated labor movement that we're used to in Western Europe and elsewhere with a, in, 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 uh, an infrastructure and institutions like the TUC, for better or worse, or the labor parties of various sorts. We have a state-dominated all-China trade union federation, which watched wages fall for 22 consecutive years until workers began to fight back. Even the All-China Federation 
has had to adapt itself to militancy in period between 2007 and 2015. What was Xi Jinping's reaction to this? They did win wage rises. They did set up legal aid centres in cities to help striking workers and so on. Xi Jinping's reaction was to smash the movement. This is what state capitalist leaders do. A variety of mechanisms were chosen. One, crack down on NGOs. Why NGOs? Because expatriate Chinese youngsters who are getting an education elsewhere or whose parents had moved elsewhere with them and they'd grown up in Australia or America or wherever, were going back and offering legal advice to uh, Chinese workers on strike, doing leaflets, pamphlets, simple things. You know, how to get legal advice. What happens if you're arrested? The NGOs were part of a fueling of the movement. So too were the Marxist study circles in universities. So the universities cracked, uh, clamped down on that. Then there were other laws passed. Laws on state security, national security laws. Every institution, everybody is an arm of the state. And therefore, the imposition of Chinese communist cadre in senior management positions in all transnational corporations. So the irony, if it, if it is an irony, Walmart is anti-union in America and a quarter of its executives in China are in the Chinese Communist Party. If you believe it's state capitalist, it's not much of an irony, actually. It's just an irony in the name communist. That's the nature of the regime. That's internally. Now, if it's socialist, what sort of socialism puts out the Young, Ch the young Communist League put out a little uh, mascot recently? To, I'm not sure what the reason was for the mascot. One of these things like Mishka the Bear at the Moscow Olympics, that sort of thing. Within hours, hundreds of thousands of women had gone on Twitter or whatever the equivalent is and said, is the little girl, whatever her name was, beautiful land, uh, Zhang Shang Zhao, lovely land. They said these sorts of things. Uh, this is the Communist Youth League mascot. If your husband hits you, do the police respond? Did your parents want another child because you are a girl? Does your boss give you smaller portions of food at work because you are female? Does your value go down when you turn 30 in the, in the marriage market? That's not socialism. That, Xinjiang, that's not socialism. The, Hong Kong, that Sally mentioned, but you, we could have mentioned the, you know, of course there's a Western narrative on this. The figures are astronomical in the, on the alt-right. Two million Uyghur Muslims are incarcerated. The figures are probably far below that, and yet the oppression is extremely real. It may well be uh, half a million. It doesn't really matter. The point is, these are systemic problems. It's the nature of state capitalism that cannot tolerate any allegiance to anything outside the Communist Party system. And that may be the Ummah, it may be the world uh, Islamic community, it may be whatever it may be other than the Chinese Communist Party. And that has to be crushed. These are systemic problems. Similarly, we've got a systemic problem of inter-imperialist rivalry. The precise nature of uh, Chinese imperialism is not identical to Western imperialism. It hasn't dominated the IMF that's imposed structural adjustment, but it is followed in the wake of that. It doesn't need to. The bloody places have been structurally adjusted. They do not go in and say, let's go back to Keynesianism. They go in and say, open up your markets further to us. Not more generally, you've been structurally adjusted in a variety of ways, your welfare states, your, your bread, you know, uh, support for basic commodities and so on, that's been <coughs> eradicated. Uh, but we can help by you selling stuff to us. And what do they, what do they buy? Of course, there's a you know, co colleague of mine in, in a university in Cairo has talked about technology transfer. It was the case that China's investments universally 20 years ago, 15 years ago, were extractive. There is some evidence mm. of building networks of suppliers from Egyptian or Malawian sandwich makers to feed the workers or whatever it may be, all sorts of bits and pieces. But the basic structural characteristic of going elsewhere to extract value persists. Occasionally it requires the building of a bit of infrastructure that may last longer than China's there. It may require, as a goodwill gesture, the odd school. But the essential characteristic is exploitative. And in that sense, it is very, very similar. We can... I'm not a sectarian. I am 
A very close friend of mine is uh, Kate Hudson. I'll be seeing her tomorrow at Bruce Kent's funeral. Again, I'm not a sectarian. He didn't like the SWB very much, but we were good friends and neighbours. Kate used to say, I worked with her for many years, I would say, what, what about this about Stalinism? What about the gender relations? What about extolling the virtues of the family after the early gains of the revolution? What about X, Y, and Z? Every single one, she'd say, policy mistake, mistake, mistake. 30 or 40 of the bloody things were mistakes. Actually, you ultimately have to conclude that individual mistakes are rooted in structures. They can only make those mistakes because of the structures they inhabit. They can only, however much there's exaggeration in Richard Smith's book, they can only do what they do to the environment, import food for the ruling class while the poor people have to eat the poisoned food that's grown on poisoned um, you know, um, agricultural land. They can only do that because of their position, uh, position in a structure. One final point about the debt. I, again, two weeks, in the last two weeks, very recently, China has approached the Bank of International Settlements to ask for what they call a renminbi pool, a yuan pool, a currency pool, so that other countries can draw upon the Chinese currency for trading purposes and so on, or as, and it will encourage the growth of the, the Chinese currency as a reserve currency. The ambition is to elevate its status, appro approaching, but it won't get there any time <coughs> soon, but approaching the reserve currency status of the dollar. Another characteristic of a superpower <coughs> that I didn't mention, uh, the, the power of the dollar, the, uh, what's called dollar... Um, da, 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 da. Thank you. It wasn't the word I was looking for, but it's a nice word. Um, <laughs> leverage, seigniorage. Okay. The author of the dollar lives beyond its means because we all trade in dollars and never go back to America and ask for a you know, bit of gold or whatever it may be. This is dangerous. For On the one hand, it would challenge the United States. But on the other hand, it would expose China much more thoroughly, fully, to the pressures of international markets and therefore profit rates, which they can some, so, to some extent seal themselves from, would become threat. Um, um, the, the rate of exchange of the yuan and the dollar rate, the, the uh, profit rates of the corporations, would be subject to greater surveillance. And also the states and the banks' debt. And the debt is not a myth. There is a vast amount of debt. 27% of the national income was spent by the state, relatively hermetically sealed from the financial system in the rest of the world, to prop up the world capitalist system in 2008. There's only so much debt you can generate if you're being watched much more closely by the Bank of International Settlements. So these are big risks that are being taken, but they have to be taken because of inter-imperialist rivalry. That's the crucial thing. The details are important. I was a bit worried about getting, I did have a hypersonic um, missiles written down, but I thought, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> what do we say about them? Yes, they're bloody fast, 4,000 kilometers an hour, and they're gonna be terrible things. Do we get excited about it, or do we say, what sort of society produces hypersonic missiles? <laughs> That's what we should be saying, and we need to be bringing these societies down, and that requires the organized strength of the Chinese working class, as various people have pointed out. We know they came once between 2007 and 2015. There were the embryonic beginnings of a national neighbour movement when the truckers went on strike because, by definition, they cross regional boundaries and they talk to people. Or that's what truckers do. Yeah. We've lost that one for a while, but it will come again because workers' structural position forces them to fight, and that is the grave digger that we should turn to. Yeah.